we're witnessing the birth of machine intelligence. And it's a very messy and confusing time. Uh, there's lots of different approaches. Again, we have people arguing for specific machine learning techniques to solve specific problems. Other people arguing for more universal systems. There are different types of learning algorithms. There's mathematical ones, there's memory-based ones, different types of training paradigms that are going on. It's a really messy world, trust me, if you're not living in it. But I believe the end, at the end of this decade, in fact, even before the end of this decade, we're going to settle out on a more one dominant paradigm. Now, I'm, my talk here is today is to argue for one of these paradigms. And I believe it's a paradigm that's used by the neocortex. And the neocortex is a universal algorithm, as you'll hear me talk about. It's memory-based. It is an online learning system. It learns continuously. And it's behavior-based learning. And this is going to be the dominant paradigm, I believe, for the next 50, 60 years of machine intelligence. The reason we're going to have one, for the same reasons, network effects. People are going to want to build new hardware and software and systems on top of, on top of the winning solutions. And again, why is this particular one going to win? Is because it's the most flexible. It's not always the best solution, but it's the most flexible solution and it can scale. How do we know this is going to happen? We have a proof case. The proof case is our own, our own brain, the own neocortex. And we know it's scalable, we know it's flexible. It's scalable because we know that nature has built neocortex that's very small and very large and there's no reason we can't build them larger. So my talk today is really about what this is, making the argument for this, and I think we're in this period of time right now and it's happening as we're sitting here. So um, my company has two basic goals. The first goal is to discover the operating principles of the neocortex. Now just to remind you, that's about 75% of the volume of your brain. It's the big wrinkly thing on top. It's the location of all intelligence, language, planning, high-level vision, hearing, and so on. Everything you think about is intelligent. Our second goal is to create technologies based on neocortical principles. We are not trying to build a brain or anything like a human. We're trying to build learning technologies that work on the same principles as the neocortex. This is not about passing the Turing test or building a human-like machine at all. And I think most of the future of machine intelligence will not be things that we think about human-like in the slightest. Here's the topics for my talk. I'm going to give you some, start off with a little discussion about the cortex, some facts about it. We're going to do a little neuroscience theory here. Um, then I'm going to talk about our research roadmap, where we are in, in understanding the system. Then I'll talk about applications, and I'm going to leave you with some thoughts on uh, machine intelligence. So let's just jump right into it. Um, there's a picture of a, a human neocortex. It is a memory system. It has to learn, and when you're born, it knows nothing. And the way it learns is it interfaces to the world through a set of sensors. Those sensors change some physical quantity into patterns on neurons. And when those neurons are inside the brain, it's no longer light, it's no longer touch and sound. The neurons are identical, the ones that are carrying information about from the retina, or the ones from the auditory system, it's just patterns. And the way the cortex handles these patterns, when you get to the cortex, it's identical. This is a pattern system. It's not a vision system, not an auditory system. It's a pattern system. It builds a model of the world from the changing data stream. And the data stream coming into the cortex is very rapid. My voice is it, it bringing patterns coming to you in the order of milliseconds and tens of milliseconds changes. It is a predictive model. So it's constantly making predictions of what's going to occur next. Therefore, it can constantly tell when things have changed. And it's also generating behavior. So the cortex generates all high-level behavior, such as my speech. Now, if you think about it, the patterns coming in from their senses, when you move, you're basically moving your senses to the world. So the vast majority of the changes on your sensory stream are coming from your own behavior. Your eyes are moving, my body's moving, when I touch things, these changes are coming in not because the world is changing, it's because I'm moving in the world. A lot of things do move in the world, but most of the changes coming in are from your own behaviors. So the model the cortex builds is a sensory motor model of the world. You, it's very difficult to separate those two things out. It's a sensory motor model of the world, and we want to understand that happens. Okay, so let's start with some cortical facts. There's a picture of a human neocortex. Next to it is a picture of a rat neocortex because it's all the same. Everything I'm going to tell you about today is neocortex. It's not specific to any particular animal. It is a thin sheet of cells, about two and a half millimeters thick. In a human, it's about the size of a dinner napkin. And in, it's about this big, about two and a half millimeters thick. This is you, this is me. And, um, in a rat, it's about the size of a small post-it stamp. Okay, it's a remarkably uniform system. I mean, anywhere you look in it, you'll see a detailed architecture that's preserved across species and across modalities. Incredible. 
a, a detail that's remarkably uniform from an anatomical point of view. It's functionally uniform as well. Even though there are parts of the neocortex that's vision and, and hearing, it has been known for over 35 years that the cortex processes vision, hearing, touch, and everything it does in the same way. The evidence of this is overwhelming. Most people have trouble believing it, but it's true. And, um, and so that's, it, it's a remarkably functional uniform. You can actually swap the auditory nerve and a, and, a, and a visual nerve on a young animal, and the auditory parts of the cortex become visual, and the visual parts of the cortex become auditory. We know that the cortex is it's organized as a hierarchy. These regions connect together, and if you look at the connectivity, it's a hierarchy. If you dig down and you do a slice of the cortex to that 2.5 milliliter, millimeters, you, the first thing you'll see is in an organization, you see layers of cells. There's roughly four layers of cells, layers two, three, four, five, and six. If you then dive in further, you'll see that the neurons are organized in these little mini columns. They're very skinny at about 110 to 120 cells each vertically aligned across that surface there. If you dig in further, you look at the actual neurons, they have somewhere in between three and 10,000 synapses each. They connect, and, and they basically connect to a lot of other cells, not, usually only one connection to another cell. Now, 10% or so of those synapses are close to the cell body or proximal. And this is what most people think about when they think about a neuron. They say, oh, these inputs come in and they depolarize the cell and the cell can fire. But 90% of those synapses are further away from the cell body. And for many years, people had no idea what to think of them because if you activate one of those distal synapses, it seems to have no effect on the cell body. But we now know that the dendrites away from the cell body are active processing elements. And if you have more than, say, 10 to 20 synapses become active at the same time on a short distance away from each other, so close spatial temporal proximity, that it generates what's called the dendritic spike. It goes to the soma and it depolarizes the cell. It makes the cell, it doesn't make the cell fire, but it makes the cell very close to firing. And we believe that this is a predictive uh, recognition. Further, most people think about learning in a neuron as strengthening synaptic weights. This is not really true. We now know that most of the learning occurs through the formation of new synapses. And synapses can form very rapidly on the order of minutes or seconds. New ones can appear and they can disappear. And this is a much more powerful type of learning than trying to increase the, the efficacy of a particular synapse. So this is, this, is, this is the system that we want to understand. This is you. This is me. This is, the, this is intelligence. This is what it looks like. And can we understand in detail how this works? We have an overall theory for this we call hierarchical temporal memory, or HTM. It's fairly simple. It starts with the premise that you have a hierarchy of identical memory regions. That's a fact. The next thing we say, what's the primary memory which is going on in each of these regions is a time-based memory. It's a memory of sequences. It's like learning melodies. And what every region does is it builds a model of time-based patterns, and if it can recognize those patterns, it passes the more stable representation to the next level, and you have an increasing temporal and spatial stability as you go up the hierarchy, which is observed in the brain. Similarly, you can take a high-level stable concept and unfold these sequences going down and create a very fast-changing pattern, such as my speech right now, which is what's going on in my head. Now, the questions we want to ask, how does exactly this is do this? What does the region do? What do the cellular layers do? What are the neurons? How do the neurons implement this? So we're making great progress in understanding this. Let's jump in. We'll keep going. I'm going to jump up a bit. So if, you know, bear with me if this is more than you want to hear. But we'll, we'll get some detail here, and then we'll come back up to high level again. So let's keep going down further here. The basic principle we think is going on here is that each of the layers is implementing a type of sequence memory. In fact, they use the same neural substrate in the same basic process, but they apply it in different ways. It's sort of a variation on a theme that's going on here. Now, there's two layers that are basically feed-forward layers. The in the cortex, those are layers two, three, and four. And there's two layers that are basically uh, feedback layers, layer five and six. Let's just walk through this a bit. Input comes into the cortex typically into layer four. This is the feed-forward input. Everyone thinks of this as like, oh, the input from the eyes, or this is the sensory data coming, which is true. But most people don't remember or don't know is that there's also the cortex gets a copy of your own, a, a, a copy of your own behaviors, your own motor commands. So when you move your eyes, which is done something by something called the superior colliculus, a copy of that command gets sent to the cortex. So the cortex knows what behavior was just generated. This is a universal property. And what we think is going on in layer four is that it's building a, uh, a sensory motor model. It's doing inference of sensory, uh, uh, sensory motor inference, if you will. And give you an example of that. When you look at a face and your eyes saccade over the face, 
and you're doing this three to five times a second, you're not aware of it because the world seems stable, but it's happening. Um, the pattern in which you saccade over that is not predictable. You can, it's not a, a fixed order. And so if I wanted to say, well, now that I'm seeing an eye and I want to predict what I'm going to see next, I can't just say, but, but I have to know where you're going to move. I say, well, if I see an eye and I go down to the right, I'm going to see a nose. So what's happening here in this layer, it's building a predictive model of what's going to happen when you behave given what you're seeing or feeling or hearing now. This next goes on to layer three, and layer three is a high order inference model. This is something where you're just looking at the, the sequence itself, like a melody or like my speech. And so to make a prediction of what's going to occur next, all you need to know is the sequence of things coming along. So if I know the, what the, the history over the last number of notes in a melody, I can make an accurate prediction of what's going to occur next. Then layer three projects the next level hierarchy. That's your basic feed-forward pathway. Layer five is where you have cells generating motor behaviors. So my speech right now is being generated by cells in layer five in parts of my cortex. And uh, these project subcortically to other motor areas. So the cortex basically controls other motor areas. It doesn't actually innervate muscles itself. It, it drives other things that move you. And then finally, layer six is primarily attention. It's the feedback layer. Now the points I want to make on this slide is that each layer is doing a variation of the common sequence memory algorithm. If we understand the basic model of each uh, one layer, we'll understand the basic model of all the layers. And these are universal functions. I want you to understand the, the premise here. What biology tells us, this is it. You, you do this in a hierarchy, you've got everything the cortex does. And in what you can see here, there are no pure sensory areas of the cortex. That's a misnomer. There are no pure motor areas of the cortex. That's a mis misstatement. It's all sensory motor. And this same process is being used in every modality and in a hierarchy. And if we can understand this, we are on a long way to building brains. So the question is, how does this sequence memory work? Could we really understand this? Can we understand what these layers of cells are doing? And the answer is yes. We actually think we do. We think we've made a huge progress in this. Uh, we call this uh, basically a pretty boring name, HGM temporal memory. <laughs> uh, for those of you who might have been following um, Nementa for a long time, the, previously we used to use the word CLA. Uh, but HGM temporal memory. This is a picture of one of our simulations. Uh, those little cubes or neurons, you can see they're in a layer with vertical, there's a, the many columns there. The colored cubes are either the red ones are active and the yellow ones are in a predictive state. Now I don't have time today to tell you exactly how this works. But you can go learn about it. You can see, I'll give you how, tell you how to do that in a moment. I just want to tell you the attributes of this. What this system does, what this layer of cells does, is essentially learn sequences, it recognizes and recalls sequences, and it predicts next inputs. It does all three of these simultaneously. These are not separate steps. It's constantly learning, online learning, constantly inferring over everything it's learned, and constantly making multiple predictions at the same time. Not a single prediction, but a union of predictions. It has some really nice attributes, and I'm going to tell you, because we've been building this for four years. We figured this out four years ago, uh, so we have a lot of experience with it. Um, it's very high capacity. It can learn, even a small simulation can learn millions of uh, transitions. It is a distributed system and has local learning rules. This makes it uh, naturally fault tolerant. You can lose neurons, you can lose columns, you can lose synapses. You can do a huge amount of noise on the system, and it still behaves very well, just like brains do. There are no sensitive parameters to this. It's not hard to get it to work if you, once you've built it correctly. And it actually generalizes. It's able to apply the same learning to, to new situations that are semantically similar to previous situations. Um, I, just, I want to leave you an impression about this. This is not just another neural network. There's some things that are really unique about it. Um, I'll just give you three of them. First of all, it incorporates a, a fair amount of uh, detailed cortical anatomy. Now, we didn't do this because we could do it. We did this because we had a theoretical need to do it. So we've only added features to this model that we know exists in the brain, but also we need to get this thing to work the way we think it has to work. So we, we have a model for what many columns are doing to create high order representations. We model certain inhibitory cells, certain connectivity patterns, etc. No one else does this in a kind of information theoretic model like this. The whole thing is built on sparse distributed representations. What I mean by that is that at any point in the time in the brain, only about 1%, 2%, or half percent of the cells are active. Most of them are inactive. This is the key to intelligence. We have figured out sort of the, the mathematical properties here. They're very unusual. There's a talk online you can see. We just posted the yesterday, plus some papers, describing these properties. This is the key to intelligence. If you want to understand you know, how we're going to build intelligent machines, you have to understand the representations. And sparse distributed representations have these amazing properties that are surprising. And the whole foundation of things is built on it. I, I can't go into detail about that today. <coughs> and finally, the neurons we model 
um, are, are, have active dendrites. We, we model learning by synaptic growth. Again, we had to do this. This is how we get the online learning to work. This is how we make a highly predictive system. This is unlike any other artificial neural network you've ever heard of. I'm not aware of any other system that incorporates this kind of level of detail. Uh, it may exist, but I don't know about it. Okay. Um, if you're interested in this, this is completely documented. The source code, there's people built this multiple times. You can get a lot of information at nementa.com slash learn slash. And there's some new material up there just posted yesterday you should check out. Okay, let me talk about our research roadmap. Uh, so here's the system we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand these, these layers of cells in a region of cortex. And once we can figure that out, we can go build brains. Um, where are we? We started with layer three because it's actually the simplest one anatomically. It's, it's, the, it's the cleanest one to look at. And uh, that's the high order sequence memory. And I would say we're on a theory point of view. This is purely subjective. From a theory point of view, I feel like we really understand this very, very well. So I put 98%. That's about as close as you can get to anything. There's maybe a few things we might get wrong here and there. It's been extensively tested. We put it in commercial products. We know this thing inside and out. Uh, on layer four, we figured out about a year ago what's going on here and how this builds the sensory motor model of the world. It's just a, a variation of what's going on in layer three where we're using motor commands. Uh, I would say the theory is about 80% there. Uh, we're implementing this, it's working. We have a lot more to do, but we're really, really far over the hump on this one. It's in development, this is what we're working on now. On the layer five, which is where you start generating behavior, um, we have the big building blocks of the theory. We understand the basic components about how the neurons are doing this, how they're interacting with the rest of the, the, rest of the body and the brain, but we haven't started implementing it at all, and there's a, it's a, a couple of several other big building blocks we're missing, so I put it at about 50%. Uh, but I feel really good. We're going to get this one. And, um, and then finally, layer six is more complicated, um, and um, I'm, I'm, we're, it's a little bit more nebulous what's going on down there. Okay, so that's what we've been doing. And since we started with layer three, we started with this high order instance, we got it working, it, the theory hangs together really well. We said, let's try it on real data. Let's, let's see applying it. So what we did is we said, okay, what could we do with that? Well, it, it, this is a system that this part of the cortex, this layer, basically does high order inference, uh, sequence inference, and it basically requires that the data be changing on its own. There's no behavioral component to this. So we said, let's, it can work on streaming data. Anything that's changing over time, it should work on. We can do prediction and anomaly detection and classification. So we said, there's a lot of applications here. Let's try them out. And I'll show you what we've done. Now, how you build a streaming application, a data application using this technology? Well, you take a data stream, you stick it through something called an encoder, which basically changes some number or quantity or something into a sparse distributed representation. That's the language that we need. And uh, now I have the sparse distributed representation, I feed it to the HGM, and now I get a stream of predictions or anomalies or classifications. That's what I can do with this. Now there's many, many sources of streaming data. Uh, you know, uh, John mentioned earlier, you know, we're going to be washing all this data. Yeah, most of it's streaming data. Anything you can, you can regularly get from applications and servers and, and medical data and industrial equipment and social media, all these things can generate millions and millions, billions of data sources that are changing over time. So we have a, a potentially a way of modeling that. Now, what kind of encoders? I won't tell you how the encoders work. It's kind of cool. I'll talk about it later. But we built ones for numbers and categories and dates and times. We now have one for GPS and even words. I'll talk about this in a moment. So we have everything we need to do here. And so we went and built some applications. Here are six applications I'm going to briefly talk about uh, that are all about streaming data applications. Um, on the, the top three, they're all about anomaly detection. They're similar. And the bottom three are very different. Uh, we started with server metrics. We said, let's see if we can model servers and detect when they are in anomalous states by looking at the temporal characteristics of their metrics. And that's the one we developed first, and we've turned into an actual product called Grok. The way we do that is we take some server, um, we take a bunch of server metrics off of it, things you can, you know, CPU utilization, file access, things like that. We run them through encoders. We build a model for each metric. We actually started by assuming we'd bring, combine these metrics together into a single model. We found it works better to actually build lots of separate models and then combine it later. So now what I'm doing, I'm basically modeling a temporal characteristics of various data streams. We detect when those temporal characteristics change significantly and we say there's something unusual going on here. We display the result here on a dashboard. I'll show you a mobile dashboard here. Um, from our product rock. And the way this basically works is you may be monitoring a thousand servers and or more, whatever. 
and very few of them can be anomalous at any point in time, very, very few. And so we basically sort them in order of anomaly. So how unusual they are over some last period of time, like an hour or a day or a week. And we'd show them in this little chart you see here. And the higher the graph and the, the, the little bars and the color indicate a highly anomalous state. So you only have to look at the top few things, like a little dashboard to look at. And this is continually updated. So it's running on my phone right now. And you can, you know, these, these bars move across over time as, as the servers perform. We also have a web dashboard, but I'm just going to show the mobile ones. So what kind of anomalies? We didn't know. How well is this going to work? So what kind of anomalies can detect? Now, we didn't tell the system at all what any of these numbers mean, what any of these metrics means, that the servers or anything like that. We just said, here's a stream of data. We had no idea what it was going to find. So if it turned out to be really, really good. Really good. Much better than I even imagined it could be. Um, so I'll just give you some simple examples here. You can see that on these pictures, what you're seeing is the top bar there is the server anomaly. That's in the white area. Then the middle thing is the actual metric data that was anomalous. That's the, the black with the blue lines. And then underneath it, you'll see the anomaly score for the at particular metric. So you can just look at the, when, the, when the anomaly occurred and, and the, sort of, uh, the, the graph there. So you can see some very simple things, sudden changes, slow changes, uh, sudden, subtle changes in regular data. That third picture, you might see there's a slightly different blip on, on the right-hand side there where the anomaly occurred. Because this is a regular data stream, it says that is significant, a very highly uh, significant event. Where on the one on the right there, you see it's a very noisy data stream, and any particular spike doesn't mean anything, but you can still capture these, so these sort of changes. Now, here's, the, here's where it got interesting. This is when we started seeing things like this, this is when we got really excited. This is an example, we see a lot of these, where a human can't tell what's going on. A human would not be able to see an anomaly here. This is a single server, two different metrics, two different models, both caught an anomaly at the same time. Even something as simple as CPU utilization, and I think this one is uh, disrupt bytes. And um, if you look at that data, that blue graph, you can't see what's going on. You wouldn't pick that point in time as being highly anomalous. Well, I wouldn't. But this system is statistically, you can prove it mathematically, it's going to be highly, highly unusual given recent history of this system, like over the last few weeks. What occurred here, this is a build server where every time one, an engineer checks in code, it starts a build process. And what happened on this particular day, an engineer started the build process manually at that point in time. That's it, just started it manually as opposed to automatically. You and I can't see the difference there, but it catches it. It says, I've never seen this. I've caught it in two separate models. I'm certain of it, something is unusual here. Now in this case, it could be benign, it could be a, a, a risk, something shouldn't be doing that, or it could be something malicious. We don't know. But you don't get many anomalies, and when it catches them, they're really important. So when we saw this, we said, this is really cool, and we said, what else can we apply this to? We said, Let's, can we apply it to human metrics, like you're sitting at a computer, looking at your keyboard access and your file access. Can we tell if someone has changed their behavior, or someone else is using a computer? And it turns out we can. It works very nicely. We asked, someone came to us and said, what about financial data? They said, asked us, can you predict volumes of stock trading? And we said, we don't know. They gave us the data, we looked at it, and it turns out we did a really great job at it. In a matter of an hour, we had results that equaled the best in the industry. And then we said, we can turn this into anomalies. And so what we're doing here, we can actually monitor thousands of equity trades and find when there's subtle anomalies in the volume of those trades. We're now trying to add social media data to it. Uh, we're in the process of doing this right now, trying things like Twitter and Tumblr to see if we can find anomalies in there too and combine those so someone might say, hey, there's something unusual going on at this company. This is not just for people who trade. It could be for people who, are, uh, who are, they want to track their customers, what's going on unusual in their customer, or procurement base, things like that. Anybody who wants to find that. So we think this is cool. We're going to have a product this next year. Now here's something totally different. This is a researcher at Berkeley who, um, a, a team there, they, they want to use a EEG, the scalp recordings, to control things like prosthetic arms and, and robots and things like that. So uh, they said, can we take this data, run it through the HGM, and classify it? And trying to say, like, it's, am I thinking going left? Am I thinking going right or up or down? That kind of stuff. They just did this work uh, two weeks ago, and they got really great results. I, I, I won't claim success here because I think it's too early, but um, I do think this is the kind of problem that we should be able to do a good job on. Here's a company in, uh, in Europe called PNEC. They are using this technology to, to basically track ships through the harbors of Europe. And uh, they said, look, can I, can I detect, learn the typical temporal spatial patterns of ships moving through harbors and to detect if they start moving differently than normal. 
and it turns out it works very nicely. We created a very cool encoder for GPS, so you can feed in GPS coordinates uh, into, the, into the HDM, and it turns them into SDRs, and so as a ship moves to the harbor, you can tell, is it, it the, we don't tell it what it should be looking for, but it can detect, we found so far, changes in velocity, changes in direction, uh, being out of, out of path, whatever's typical. You don't have to tell it anything which it's supposed to know. You just say, here's a whole bunch of ships, let's learn for a while, and now you tell me when something is unusual. And one thing I didn't mention is continually learning. So if there's a new pattern that becomes normal, it says, okay, after a while it says, okay, that's not anomalous anymore. <coughs> now the last example here is about natural language. And um, this is done with a company called Cortical.io. They're based in Austria. They read our papers and said, holy smokes, this is cool. They do natural language processing. And uh, they felt like the sparse distributed representations were the key to understanding natural language processing. And I agree with them, because this is the language of the brain, and it has all these nice properties of semantic representation. So they created an interesting uh, tool. They take a corpus of, of documents like Wikipedia, and they built a tool, they trained the system. And I can't, I can't explain how it does this in this short time. But what you get out of it, you can ask, give it a word or a document and say, give me a sparse distributed representation. There's a picture of them here. There are like 16,000 bits. You can see most of them are off. So these little dots are the one bits that are on and so on. Now, one of the properties of sparse distributed representations are the bits mean something. They have semantic meaning. You, you may not be able to say what it is, but they have semantic meaning. So if I have two representations and they share bits, in the same location or in the same part of the array, then they're sharing a semantic meaning. And this doesn't happen by chance, it's, it's meaningful. So you now have these <coughs> words, these representations which capture the semantic meaning of the words. All right, what can you do with this? So let's start something, you can just do some very simple things with the words themselves. You take the word, the representation for the word apple, and you take the representation for the word fruit. Now apple could mean a company, it could mean fruit, it could mean music, it could mean a lot of things. And what you're doing is you're subtracting the bits on that are on a fruit that are also on an apple, and you're removing the fruitness from apple. And you get a new SDR, which is never seen before, and you can then look and say, what is this closest to semantically? And the answer you get is computer. This is really cool. It works over all these different things you can do this. So then we said, oh, these are other words that are nearest matches after that. So then we said, let's train this. On, we train the HTM on series, this sequence, it's a high order temple pattern of words. And what can we do? It's a very simple little system that, that's doing this. So we, we created, we did a first test, which we said, okay, create a bunch of three word sentences. And it's like an animal either eats or likes something, and then what it eats or likes. So an elephant likes water, and the elephant eats grass, something like that. We train it on 50, 60 sentences like this. Now, we then give it a new sentence. Now, what I say by new, the system has never seen the word fox. And we feed in fox eats, and the HTM always makes predictions, so it's going to predict something. Now, how, what do I mean? It's never seen the word fox. Think about it. Fox has semantic meaning. It can mean an animal. It can mean a news station. Maybe it means something else. The point is, it has this meaning in it. And so those meanings overlap other words that the system has already seen. So even though it's never seen fox before, it's seen things which have semantic overlap with fox. And so we can ask it like, well, what do you think a fox eats? And you get an output, you look it up, and the answer we got was rodent. Never seen the fox before. And this is the first time I believe that anyone has even, in this small little example, has taken brain's representations, how they work, in brain neural mechanisms, and this is the, the, the core of how language is processed in the brain. This is not, uh, this is, the, 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 we're getting close to the real way this is happening in brains. Uh, this system is completely unsupervised. It does semantic generalization. It actually works across languages. You can mix and match languages. They did a very cool job at this. We think there are many, many applications here. We're excited about it. They're excited about it. We're not talking about what those applications are yet, but we think we can do some uh, really cool things that no one else has been able to do before. Okay. I want to make one point here. Every one of these six applications, and only one of these is a real application, the other are just sort of, uh, you know, demonstrations, but the code is available for them. They all run on the exact same code. I mean, not a recompilation, not a reparameterization, not a tuning, the exact same code. We didn't tweak anything. We just said, change the data type, new encoder, run it through the system, what do you get? I think that's a very powerful statement. Uh, it's getting at the core fundamental uh, flexibility of these algorithms. And, uh, you know, if you asked a bunch of data scientists to do something like this, they wouldn't come up with one algorithm to do all these things. 
Uh, and this does really well on all these without any modification whatsoever. Let's go back to our research roadmap. I talked about how we did layer three and then the applications we can build there. We're in the process of doing this layer four, the sensory motor inference. What kind of applications can we build there? Well, imagine this. Again, this is like your eyes saccading over an image. So we can do static pattern recognition. So we can work with static data, but we have to have an active learning system. You have to move through the data. Instead of the data moving itself, the data is more static. You move through the data, and that's how the brain learns. So uh, we can do classification, and we can do prediction in this case. We are currently working on a vision paradigm because that's a very well understood problem. So we're working on um, uh, image classification, but we're doing it the way the brain does it. Um, but there are many applications here. I think what you want to think about is anything which has spatial structure you want to classify. So you can imagine some sort of network, whether it's people networks or computer networks, and you want to classify it. You want to say, okay, I'm going to have the system look through the data, and it's going to come back to me and make classifications, predict what it's going to see. You could, you could use this in analyzing a corporate structures or financial structures or social network media structures and so on. I think there's going to be some amazing applications that come out of this besides vision. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. When you go on to layer five, which is where you've, now you get goal-oriented behavior. And this is where the whole thing can really be blown open, I believe. Um, not only you get robotics, of course, but you'll be able to do things which are virtual, like smart bots or, uh, uh, or proactive defense. Now you're not just moving through the data in a simple way. You're moving in a way where you're, you're trying to achieve a goal or an end game. And I, said, I think we have the basics of this down, understanding how it works, but there's, we're, we, we haven't started working on it yet, but we, we need to finish the other stuff first. And finally, the last layer of six is really about enabling larger hierarchies with the multicentral modalities. Um, okay, uh, we're very transparent in our research. Um, all these algorithms are documented. Uh, I wish they were better documented, but they're documented well enough that many people have independently created these in multiple languages around the world. So that proves that they're well enough documented. We, uh, we have an open source project called NewPIC, which is at nementa.org. There we've placed all of our own software, which is a GPL format. We also have a commercial license. Uh, we even post our daily research code. Um, so you can look at all our messy stuff we're doing. And we have active discussion groups for theory and implementations. We have lots of collaborations. We have a small collaboration with a group in IBM, uh, Albin and Research, who've been looking at these algorithms. We have a collaboration with DARPA, who's trying to get a program going for the cortical processor, which is based on HTM, and com little companies like Cortical I.O. We're very open. We're just trying to make this thing happen. That's what we're trying to do. And anything that works, uh, we're open for. This is uh, just a, a, a chart of our open source community. We started about 15 months ago. It's been growing very nicely, continuous uh, growth. Uh, and more and more people are getting excited about this. More and more people are actually understanding it. There's some people out there who really deeply understand what we're doing, um, and you know, as, as well as we do. Um, it's just scary, but that's happening. OK, I'm going to end my talk um, with, a, a, with a story. And it's a true story. Um, 21 years ago. I gave a talk at Intel, and uh, they have an annual meeting where they bring in the top 200 uh, managers in the company from around the world, plus the exec staff, to do business planning. And part of that meeting, they have an uh, invited outside speaker. And 21 years ago, I was the invited outside speaker. I talked about the future of personal computing. And I said, in the future, it's all going to be about mobile devices, pocket-sized computers, and that billions of people are going to own these and uh, it's going to be their primary access to a computer and information. I made it clear that the desktop and the laptop were not going to go away, but that the growth and the innovation and the profits were going to be in, in mobile devices. I suggested that Intel was a, a company perfectly positioned to capitalize on that new trend in mobile computing. So. Um, after my talk, it was, a, it was a, a right at the lunch time, so I sat down with everyone in the room, and I sat at a table with Gordon Moore and a bunch of other senior execs, and uh, the conversation got awkward very quickly. Um, <laughs> they did not believe a word I said. And they said to me, well, what are the applications going to be for these mobile computers? Why are a billion people going to buy these things? And I honestly said, I don't know. I said, um, Here's what I do know. I know it's going to be primarily about information access, because that's what you can do on a small device. I said, I know some simple things, like a calendar and address book. People are going to want those. And I said, I know people are going to want to access information on a small device. And I know we can, we'll be able to build machines that will be capable of that. But I don't know what the applications are. But I tell you, it's going to be great. 
it didn't work. Um, three years later, we introduced the Palm Pilot, which was essentially a calendar and address book, but it was a computer. And a year after that, we had thousands of applications on it. Three years after the Palm Pilot, we introduced the Trio, which is one of the first smartphones which I designed. And, uh, and today, of course, 20 years later, uh, I bet you every one of you has one of these computers in your pocket. And it is the, the driving force. Now here I am today, I feel deja vu. Um, I'm talking not about the future of personal computing, but the future of computing. I've said we've had 60 years of one paradigm, I think we're about to start the next 60 or 100 years of a different paradigm. And, and the, the future is about machines that learn, and I'm very confident to say that those machines are going to be built on the, pro, uh, the principles of the neocortex. Sparse distributed representations are going to be essential. That algorithms of, of the temple learning, distributed temple learning algorithms are going to be part of this. I'm very confident in this. These principles I talked about are going to be the foundations for machine intelligence. Once again, I'm speaking to a company that I think should be a leader in this field. And maybe you're going to be. Um, but you know, IBM has all the right roots and all the right history and all the right capabilities to do this. One of those is, by the way, is we have to build really neat, cool hardware that's unlike anything that's ever been designed before. And how many companies can do that? You know, IBM's one of those. Once again, the biggest question I get is, what are the applications going to be for machine intelligence? <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I, can, I showed you what we're doing now. I think some of those are pretty cool. Uh, I showed you what we're going to do next. I can sort of lay out a roadmap. But those applications, as cool as they are, and maybe as big as they might be, are kind of like the calendar and the address book. You know, we can't really know, and I, you can't pretend. But I've shown a roadmap to get there. Um, and I'm very confident this is going to happen. This is not going to happen in a long time. I am sure in two to four years, we're gonna this is going to be going. This is going to be a big business. And 20 years from now, Machine intelligence is going to be driving this industry in so many different ways, and I hope I'm here for that time. Thank you very much. Well, I will, I will tell you that this is very different than that luncheon. <laughs> uh, we've made a decision. We're, the community's here, and it's, it's really about building this out. So. Uh, Jeff, we, we've got time for some questions, and uh, let's ask those in the audience or those are in the remote sites or in our remote labs. Wait for the mic. Uh, all right. Do you want to call out people? Or should I call? Why out don't them? you look for friends? Well, I, I don't and look, I'll look for friends. Friendlies. I saw a hand. I'm not, I, 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 I need. But let's start with Bob. I need Darnell. people who are going like, to correct me, so I don't want friends. <laughs> <laughs> really, really wonderful, fun talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, w the one thing I, I wonder about is uh, your thought that synapses grow uh, de novo as opposed to being tunable. Because my sense of uh, neurobiology and cancer biology and genomics generally is that I don't think uh, of it as a new versus old uh, set of growths in a cognitive learning system, but rather in vivo, in the brain at least, and in biology, I think of it as tunable, much more subtle than, than you're uh, suggesting. So w have you thought about that, and have you thought about whether connections could be made in your system to be tunable as opposed to yeah. black and white? So let me, let me approach that. Is, can everyone hear that question? Yes? OK. Um, let me approach it two different, t two different takes on it. First of all, synaptic growth and synaptic modification are really just on the same spectrum. Uh, you know, increasing the e efficacy of a synapse uh, is, is, you know, growing a new one is very, very similar. It's this, I'm, I'm starting from zero as a, you know, and, and to one versus, you know, it's not really that different than you think. It just has a, you have a much bigger information capacity if you're able to start new, form new connections. But I want to make a point. In real synapses, uh, real synapses are very noisy. Uh, they often don't work at all. Uh, an action potentializes a synapse, and it may not release any neurotransmitter. It really, it's just they're very stochastic devices. And so anyone who requires an information theoretic uh, synapse that has even one digit of precision, if it requires that, it's not biologically possible. So um, I'm not saying you can't strength in the tuning synapses, it's just that you can't really rely on it. But going from no synapses to a real synapse is a very strong event. And, um, and so 
it's, it's, it's not a, I'm not trying to like say, you, you know, it's not possible, I'm not trying to say it's different, it's just a much more powerful way of learning. And we know what's happening. Um, and by the way, it's another thing, a real advantage of it, it allows the system to, um, to basically experience a pattern a few times and start forming a connection before it actually has any effect. So you might, you might not want to affect behavior until you've experienced something a few times. And so by the growth of a synapse, what we do is we, we, we increase something called a permanence, where you have an axon and a dendrite near each other, they have nothing between them. That's a zero permanence. And as you increase the perm permanence, which is a heavy and type learning, you're essentially growing that uh, philopedia towards the, towards the, the dendrite, uh, towards the axon. And when you make the first connection, you then, we, we give the strength of the synapse a one. It's a weight of one but it's not very permanent, it can be very easily forgotten. But if you've increased training, it becomes a, a longer lasting memory and it's harder to forget. So we've chosen that uh, paradigm. I, it's just a much more powerful information paradigm. And this, you know, when you learn something, basic the whole learning model here is not just tweaking something, it's like I need to learn something new, I need, this is a new pattern, this is a new idea, this is a new animal. And you have to really lay these foundations down quickly. So I, maybe I'm just trying to say overall there's some biological evidence for what we're doing, a lot of it actually, and also I don't think it's diametrically opposed to the, the principles that you adhere to anyway. I think it's just a variation on a theme there. This question, gentleman here, I saw his hand next. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. You, I, I'm sorry, okay. I didn't see your hand. You're okay, holding a mic. I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I'm mapping the cerebral cortex, and of course I'm very excited about the talk that you gave here. Um, I'm just wondering, you so much emphasized uh, the, the uniform principles of organization um, in the mouse and rat brain as compared to the human brain, and if you just have a look to the thickness of the cortex, this is of course true. It's, maybe by a factor of two, uh, it is larger in the human brain as compared to the mouse brain. But when you look to the number of cells, it's about 2,000 2, times larger. When you look to the connectivity, it's about uh, 50,000 times larger in the human brain as compared to the mouse brain. And this is not only a question of quantity, it's also a qualitative question because in the human brain there are more areas which are not present there, there are other gene expression patterns. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether a system which is so much relying on the cortical architecture as humans would benefit from not so much emphasizing the uniform character of the cerebral cortex, but yeah. more emphasizing yes. the differences between cortical areas but because it is uh, also the interplay yeah. between different cortical areas which makes the human brain uh, so yes. powerful and so effective in contrast to yes, the Yes, yes, I'm very familiar with this uh, line of thinking. Um, so look, what I presented today, I try to make it look simple, right? That's, that's my goal today. And, and as, a, as a scientist who's trying to understand fundamental principles, you have to try to get at the core principles. Now, Cortex is not nearly as simple as I pointed out here. There are other structures involved. We study the thalamus and the, you know, all, there's tons of stuff that's going on that I didn't talk about. Now, in the cortical world, it can be divided into two, two ways of thinking about it. One way is to say, what are the common principles that are operating everywhere, and what are the variations on it? There are variations. Not all cortical regions are identical. There are variations in the theme going on here. The way I view it is that you want to understand those common principles first, and then you can ask, how do I deviate from that? Why does a rat have a bowel cortex? Why, did it, why does it form that for the whisking sense? Um, why do we see you know, a striate layer 4 in V1 in certain mammals but not in other mammals? You know, those kind of questions. Why do we see certain cell densities? Uh, nothing I presented here, I believe, was incorrect. Um, there are further variations on a theme that evolution has discovered. And so it's perfectly good line of research to say, what are the differences between these areas? And most people focus on that. They, they, it's almost like saying, well, this is a vision area, it must be different. Or this is a language area, it must be different. Let's try to find some magic cell over here that does, which may exist. But the point is, I want to try to find those common principles. And once you find the common principles, then you can do variations on a theme on it. From a, theoretic, from a theorist point of view, I believe that's the way to go. The evidence for common principles is, is unequivocal. The evidence for variations on it is also unequivocal. So, but I just, we choose to find the common principles first, understand those in detail before we go and say, well, why did this species or this region slightly different? Slightly different. We're not talking about radically different. Um, uh, th that, I think, would be a mischaracterization of it. Um, so, again, I try to stick to themes which I can justify across all species uh, and uh, basically across all areas. 
And I didn't get into variations like, oh yeah, well, why is this dry it before? You know, you know, it's not the, you know, that's a perfect example. You know, in humans and certain mammals, we have layer four subdivided in V1. And, uh, but there are other mammals that don't have a subdivided V4, and, and they see too, but they may not see as well as we do. So let's not worry about that detail yet. We'll come back to that later. That's, that's my basic answer to that question. Uh, Jeff, uh, great work, and thank you for sharing. Uh, my question is along the same line. You're doing your, your common core model here, uh, but in your hierarchy, are you actively looking toward the differences that might be involved uh, in, in a youth learning pattern, for example, versus the, the common uh, adult model you're on right now, since there seem to be some differences in, in synapse formation there? Uh, sure. I mean, there's a lot that goes on. Uh, we could talk for a long time here about uh, how the synapses are formed and what, what level, how the connectivity is derived. You know, um, we have a lot of advantages in software that the brain doesn't have. Uh, so, for example, let's, when we know that when a, when a mammal is born, especially a human, there's a dense overconnectivity at birth in early life, and it gets pruned back very quickly. Um, now, you know, we can speculate why that is. We can say, look, the neurons don't know where they're supposed to connect there. They're trying to find, I didn't explain the mechanisms here, but they're basically trying to find other cells that predict their own activity, other cells that are active before they become active. That's the sequence memory. And they don't know where to look for that. Right? So, and it could, and, and we do know in the brain that there are certain directions they do need to look if they're going to find the right pattern. And uh, so you can start at birth, you can have this over profundity of connections, and then you say which ones are established, and then you forget the other ones, right? Um, as an adult, it's harder to learn new things because you don't have that ability. We can't, a neuron doesn't say, I need to go over there about a half a millimeter and find that cell. They can't do that. Um, they don't only be nearby. So we don't have to deal with that issue in our, in our models. We can start off by saying, hey, look, we can give a, it's in software, and software is really easy to do this stuff. We have this huge connectivity matrix. We still have topology. The cell is still going to connect to some other cells nearby. But I can just essentially say, it's like you have synapses everywhere around here, and you'll find the ones that you need to connect, which actions to connect to. Where brains, real biologically, has to grow these things. And, and this, you know, you can have at birth, you have one type of thing going on. Later in life, we know that if you want to learn new things, you have to actually progressively get closer to that. Um, so the dendrites and the axons can grow. So it's a complex field um, your question relates to. But um, again, from a technology point of view, we don't have to deal with that. We can just get back and say, okay, what, you know, we can skip that part. We don't have to say, like, at birth, it looks like this. Um, we can just have a large connectivity matrix that's very sparsely connected, doesn't cost as much, um, and so we can just have that all the time. Our, our systems are like brains at birth. They never have to prune back. They just have potential connections everywhere. Yes, Guru. Uh, Jeff, um, uh, this is a classic question I'm sure you've heard many times before. So we invented um, flying machines that don't look like birds, right? So yeah. uh, why do you think computing machines are going to look like the brain? And, and, and more importantly for me right now, what is an alternative architecture that you may have seen in your research that yeah could get to a similar uh, intelligence goal. Yeah, I do hear this a lot. Uh, you know, if you go back and look at the history of the Wright brothers, th this is a misapplied analogy, this like, well, brains don't flap their wings. The Wright brothers knew they had to understand the principles of flight. And they studied birds to understand the principle of flight. They knew that the principle of flight had to do with wing design. They did wind tunnel tests. They did this. They knew they had to get the principle of flight. They knew that propulsion was something completely different. So airplanes share the principle of flight that birds share. But the principle of propulsion wasn't important. That wasn't the thing they were trying to do. It doesn't matter if you have a propeller or a jet engine, it doesn't matter. But the principles of flight are the same. And they knew that. Same thing applies here. The principles of intelligence are important. The actual implementations are not. Now, this could be conceived as conje you know, conjecture or subjective. Why do I think these principles of flight? Are there other ones like it? My walking assumption is, now I've been at this now for a long time. Um, over 30 years I've been working at this. And, um, you know, I, my, originally I started by doing a literature search of AI and a literature search of linguists and a literature search of neural networks, and I just spent, I read thousands of papers on all these things. And, uh, and I have watched the world evolve. I watched artificial neural networks come back. I observed the 1980s uh, back propagation and so on. And I kept saying, you know what, these guys aren't getting any closer. And it seemed obvious to me that you ought to look at a brain. If we want to build a cognitive system, what's the only example we've got? A brain. Now, why would I look anywhere else? 
Um, now, we, we might have some hubris and say, well, we're smart enough, we don't need to look at brains, we'll figure it out on our own. Well, maybe that's true, that could have been true. It doesn't appear to have happened. I haven't seen it happening. So, then when you go look in the brains, you find surprising principles. You find it's an amazing, surprising thing that there are common architecture across all these different modalities. It's a, and then we learn about sparse distributed representations. Those are amazing. These are things no, I would have never thought of. I wouldn't have thought of as a hierarchy of similar regions. I would have never guessed that stuff. So uh, at some point, we can throw away the brain. We'll know enough. We'll just do our own thing. But I, that hadn't happened yet. So, and if you think you can do it some other way, that's great. I just don't know how. And I don't know what it is. I've never seen anything else like it. Uh, so to me, this is the way to go until we know better. All right, okay, I don't have one, more, one more question. I don't have, we'll you have get a John mic back last. there? We'll take right. one up here. Let's gentleman up there. And then we'll finish Very with interesting. John. This is on. Very yes. interesting talk. Um, and I agree with the, the question there, but I, I want to bring this to, to a higher level rather than at the level of neurons and things like that. Because one of the questions I have is, you know, there's a lot of evidence of machine learning around sparse representation. It's not a new concept. Um, one of the questions I have for you is there's a lot of infrastructure that you're building here and a lot of things. Is there any evidence that this is buying anything that doesn't currently exist? If you just threw random forest you know, techniques, machine learning techniques at the data, would you get anything different? That's the first question. The second question, or any better, um, the second question is, you know, fundamentally, the cognitive system um, works at a symbolic representation. And uh, there's clearly a grounding problem between data input and that grounding problem. Um, you know, we have one of the foremost researchers here, Ann Treisman, who's done work on this since the 80s, of the binding problem, being able to differentiate between different pieces of information and understand how they're different. So the next time I see you, despite that, probably 90% of your, your the, the optical input will be different, that is, you're probably gonna be wearing different clothes, I still recognize you because I understand where the important information is. But more importantly, I can tell you what's different between those two things. I can say his shirt is different, yeah. not which pixels are different or which yeah. neurons are firing is different. So I want to make sure that as we're moving forward in this, and I, I agree with the existence proof, right? The human brain does things that nothing else can do. So we have existence proof. We should be looking at that. But I want to make sure that we're not focusing on the wing flapping yeah. and not lift. Yeah. And my feeling is, is this feels to me much more like wing flapping than it does emphasizing lift. Okay, those are two very different questions, and uh, so I'm going to take them both of you. You said only one question. Oh, go ahead. Um, uh, so let's get back to the first one. Oh, can we do a better? Is this better than applying random forest or some other type of learning technique? In the very beginning analogy I made here is is that. Um, you know, I, I'll never say it's better than some, you know, take three PhDs, stick in a room, try to solve a problem. Can I be better than them? I don't know. Um, probably not. The point, the argument of my analogy in the beginning, it's flexibility that drives platforms. And, um, and what we found so far in our testing and other people's testing, not just us, other people's testing, is that these networks perform very quickly, get up to parity or very close to parity of the best solutions out there. And then you people get into these benchmarks where they're saying, well, I can get 3%, 1%, half percent better, blah, blah, blah. But we got there in a half an hour and they spent, you know, three months. Literally, that's what it's been like for us going through this. Also, most of the existing machine learning techniques do not handle time very well at all. They're just not about time-based patterns. And so it's hard to actually sometimes make equivalent comparisons on these things. But again, it's really the flexibility that matters and, the, and that's the key there for that piece. Now, the second one, um, I actually don't believe the binding problem is a problem. And, um, but I'll tell you this, though. The sparse distributed representations answers that question about knowing what's important, what's different. What's, you have to get into this. Read the paper, watch the video on this stuff. Um, it basically represents in a distributed fashion all the attributes of something, semantically. And you just really are doing a bit comparison between patterns to understand what is semantically similar and what is semantically different. And you could still recognize them as the same thing. It really, it is the key to solving the representation problem in AI. You know, as an AI researcher once came to, my, to the Redmond Research Institute, and he said to me, he's just retired after a year in AI, and he said, you know, I mean, a lifetime in AI, and he said, um, you know what, this the problem of representation is the biggest problem in AI, and he goes, no, it's the only problem in AI, the problem of representation. And I didn't understand what he meant by it at the time. I now understand what he meant by it, and I now understand the solution to it. It's sparse distributed representations. Just have to, I'll have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thanks.
Thank you.